today on Ask This Old House. Landscape lighting is really a great way to make your yard design pop. I'll show you how to install it. So we're going to start at our furthest point and start tucking the wire in. The next thing is we're going to stuff the wire into the trench we dug and start backfilling as we go. Have you ever thought about the physics behind your toilet? Well, I have. And I'll show you the basic principle that makes a toilet work. And I'll show you how to organize all those small hand tools using some hooks and a pegboard. So this was one of the first projects I did at the house. Right. As you can see, it's a little choppy. This walkway was installed in a hurry, and it shows. But I'll show you how to do it the right way. Adding landscape lighting to the pathways or garden areas of your yard can really enhance the landscape. Whenever I'm getting ready to install landscape lighting, there are a few things we have to look at. The first and probably most important is where is our nearest power source? So in this case, we already have a receptacle located nearby where we can mount the transformer. This is going to become our starting point. The next step is to decide where we want to install light fixtures and what type of fixtures we want to put there. So the first thing I want to work on are some of the path lights and you want to take into account where you want to light this up. Uh, one of these areas, especially a step, we want to make sure we accent this. So I'm thinking one on each side, maybe right here. That way we can see the drop off of the step and not be too far in the way of the other side. While we're in this section, we're going to work on a couple of up lights. Uh, and I'd like to put them over here, and I really want to accent this brick archway. So this way we can wash up with this, and it'll have a really look, nice look at night. And we can adjust these later on as well. And now we'll put the other one on the other side. Again, trying to stay back roughly a foot or so. For over here, we have a nice shrub that I really want to highlight. And the best way to do that is with an up light. Landscape lighting is usually connected using a low voltage wiring system. While there are line voltage systems available, most commonly you'll see a low voltage system in a residential application. So in this case, we'll be using a low voltage cable like this. And what will happen is we have two conductors where one will be the 12 volt positive, the second one will connect to the common terminal on the transformer. The advantage to this is it's only 12 volts. It's much safer than line voltage. So if you were to cut the wire accidentally in your garden, nobody's going to get hurt. We're going to try to follow the path up against the edge as best we can. That way the wire has less of a chance of getting damaged if we do any plantings. Now that we have everything laid out the way we want it, we can go ahead and start making our connections. And in order to do that, we're going to use this guy. We're going to use a little brass barrel connector. And what happens with this is we'll stick the wires on each side of this connector. We'll be able to tighten down with the Allen screw. Then we're going to use this heat shrink that comes with it to slide over. Once we do that and heat it up, it has an adhesive inside that seals it up and makes it waterproof, and it's never going to be a point of failure. So at the existing receptacle, I'm going to install the transformer. This unit plugs directly into our 120 volt receptacle that's already there, and then it converts that to roughly 12 volts AC. We take our two wire that we just ran all the lights, come up inside, put one to the common terminal, one to the 12 volt terminal, and that gives us our low voltage. This system is designed to have a photocell plugged directly into it. That way this comes on at dusk automatically and turns off at dawn. 
Now you may not want it staying on all night and that's okay. If you don't, you can use the photo cell in conjunction with the timer. With that, this system will still come on at dusk, but then you can set the time that it goes off. Let's say you want it to go off at 10 o'clock every evening. It'll go off at 10, come on at dusk, you don't have to worry about it. All right, now that all the connections have been made and the system has been tested, it's time to bury the wires. So what we're going to do is I'm going to use a flat shovel like this, and I'm going to dig a little channel. We want to get down about four to six inches, six is a little better if we can, and we're just going to open this up. So we're going to start at our furthest point, start tucking the wire in. What I'm going to do is I want to leave a little coil right here at each fixture. This is for anything that's growing, changing, whatever happens down the road. You want to have the ability to move the fixture if a plant gets bigger, if you change the garden bed, if you change anything, you want to have some flexibility. This will allow you to do that. The next thing is we're going to stuff the wire into the trench we dug and start backfilling as we go. And if you don't feel that you can get down there hard enough with your hands, Feel free to grab a tool that's got a blunt end on it, something that's not sharp that won't puncture the jacket that'll give you a little bit of a hand of pushing that down all the way to the six inch mark. While the work for installing outside landscape lighting is fairly straightforward, it can get a little expensive at times. Fixtures can cost you anywhere from $5 a piece to up to a couple of hundred dollars a piece. And if you have to call an electrician to help with the power, it can even get a little more expensive than that. That being said, I still think it's a worthwhile investment for your yard. It adds safety, functionality, and it really extends your outdoor living space. All right, Richard, what do you got for me today? A little bit of science. I thought we would take a minute to talk about siphons. Okay. Uh, you're going to need a siphon. If you say, say you wanted to get the water from this tank to a lower point, and you didn't have a pump. Mm -hmm. So if I had a pool or a fuel tank or something, I would need the presence of a short leg and a long leg. Now that means if I had a little short leg of tubing here Coming up from the back and then the longer one down here, what would happen is once I got the water up the short leg, the weight of water in the longer leg would pull that bucket completely empty. More water here, more weight here. Correct. It starts to pull down on that. So let me just show you an example here. I'll fill this with water. And this is the key to a siphon, right? You got to actually have this water completely mm -hmm. filled in the tube. So now, here it is here. Now watch what happens. Wow, look at that. So, is that something? I mean, it's just literally just flowing all by itself. It's kind of crazy. I mean, no pump, no nothing. Yeah. It's just working. Right. So it's really a handy thing to know about because uh, you don't always have a pump and you don't have one that works quite often. Now that will keep on going until it goes empty or I break the vacuum. So watch this. So as soon as that pops out and you get air in the tube, everything stops. If I couldn't put my finger over the hose, I could also do this. This is what you see in movies when guys are trying to take gas out of a gas tank. Right. <laughs> I never did that. I never did that ever in my life. <laughs> but there it is. I mean, it's still just flowing. It's as if it's being pumped. That's right. Right. Good. So everybody uses the basic siphon principle multiple times a day because that is the principle that makes the basic toilet work. So if this is the cutaway of a to toilet bowl, the water level normally sits right here. Mm -hmm. If you look right here, this piece inside the china is the short leg. The short length here. Right. Water is right to this level. And then right here, from this point on, is the long leg. So the length, the curves make it almost twice as long as right. this. So if I can get the water level to come up and fill up this point over the top, I will start the siphon. And you're a plumber, so you're going to put your lips down here. And <laughs> no, pull. I'm not. <laughs> so the tank is right here. When you flush the tank, water comes down into this flush ring. You see it right here? Yep. The water also comes out through here, but it also comes down inside the bowl to this little hole right here called a siphon jet. Mm -hmm. And that jet pushes water, where's it go? Right up that short leg. Yep. And so if it does, it then fills this spot right here your siphon begins. And now it'll keep pulling up the short leg 
down the long leg until that water level drops and that air comes behind it and vacuums the chief. So long as it gets up over this hill and it's full water here to create that vacuum, you're good to go. It'll just keep going. Absolutely. It'll keep going until the empties. bowl is empty. And as you say, it's kind of marvelous because there's no pump, there's no electricity, and it does it time and time again, day after day. It's one of the greatest inventions ever, says the plumber. Absolutely. So you can also use this siphon principle to make a toilet flush, even if the water was off in the house temporarily, as long as you had a bucket of water. Mm -hmm. Because if I poured, say the bowl had to be evacuated, and I pour it in, watch what happens. Look at that. And there it goes. Just flushes itself. Absolutely. It's really cool. Thank you, Mr. Science. Thank you. Tommy, you want to talk a little tool storage? Yeah, I mean, you know, you always have a tool bench or something where you throw all your tools and you're trying to find it, you don't know where it is, or maybe you don't want to keep them on a bench, you throw them in a drawer, but you don't know what drawer you put them in. So, you know, you can always hang a pegboard on a wall. So if you have your workspace, you can hang it like this. We've got it organized pretty good. All right, and what did you bring us? What's this material this here? This is quarter-inch masonite. All right. It has quarter-inch holes. You can also buy it with a smaller hole, eighth-inch hole. And this is painted. You can get it unpainted if you don't want it white. Beautiful. Okay? Now, if you have an open stud bay like this, you'd simply take the pegboard up, put it on the studs, and put a couple of screws in it. Line this and, up for you here. Okay, we're getting ready to birth. Got it. That. Good over here. Now the nice thing about an open stud bay, it gives you the space that you need to mount the hook onto the pegboard. In other words, the space that you need behind the holes because... Right. So this goes in, and if you had a solid wall there, you're not going to get it in. Because it's sticking out on the other right. side. So right. you have to stand the pegboard off the wall. So if you had a workshop, for example, and it was wood on the wall or plaster or whatever, drywall, you want to make sure that you stand it off with scrap wood. I just take scrap two by fours, two by six, whatever they are, and I rip down three quarter inches out of it, and I mount them to the surface of the wall. That gives me the space that I need behind yep, the pegboard to get the hook in. But yep. you want to make sure that you mount them where there's structure behind gotcha. it. Gotcha. Okay? Now That'll give you a little bit of the gap behind so you can put the pegs in. Right. All right, want to do some organization? Yeah, we'll organize some good different hooks here. We'll put them on the wall, see what we have. Let's, uh, let's put some chisels up there like that. Put this guy in for screwdrivers. Got a couple wrenches and uh, maybe use the holes on the handles. Yeah, we can use some singles for that. Now the trick with those singles, they're so light that when you pull the wrench off, they may come right off the wall. So they actually make these little locks right here that go on. And you just put one in the hole beside it. You line up the hook into that and push it into the hole. And that locks it in nice and tight. Now when you take the wrench off, doesn't move around. I've got some bins here, Tommy. I'll put those in. And it's good for like loose hardware and stuff, nuts and bolts. I've got some eye hooks right here. Perfect. Got a couple jars here too, Tommy. Screw them in place. Now you can see them. No problem. Blades down here. Like that. Finished up, huh? Oh, satisfying, right? Makes you feel organized. It feels organized. That pile of tools was on our workbench. It's now organized on the wall. Nice job, Tommy. Thank you. Thanks for the help. Hey, Mark. Hey, Dan. Hey. Thanks for coming out. All right, thanks for having me, and this is the walkway. This is it, right all here. Right, all uh, right. So this was one of the first projects I did at the house. I was a little rushed, kind of slapping everything together. We had uh, our first daughter born only a week after I finished, so okay. I didn't have much time to, to do it. And right. as you can see, it's a little choppy. All right, well, every time that I see some humps, some low spots, some gaps in the brick, I always assume that the base is the problem. The base is the most important part of these walkways, so if you rush it, it results in this type of thing. So what I think we should do is pick up all the brick, see what you have for a base, fix what you have for a base, 
put the brick back in, and I think you'll be all set. It sounds like a plan. All right, let's get going. All right, thanks. All right, this looks like a good place to start. So what I'm going to want you to do, get this brick out, get that brick out. I'm going to get under the rest of it with this uh, little pick, and we'll peel up all the brick. Main thing here is we want to save these brick. We're going to reuse them. Little pieces like this, no good to us, so don't worry about those. But uh, we'll save everything else on the side. So why don't we get going? All right. All right. Start right here. Yep. Pull that out. That's it, all right. That might be all I need. So you'll want to pick these brick up and stack them. All right, so this wasn't quite as bad as I thought, but every good walkway has two ingredients. This is the pack run. It's just gravel and stone dust mixed together and it helps let this walk fluctuate a little bit with the freeze thaw cycle. The second ingredient, which you do not have, is stone dust. So it's basically crusher run without the gravel. This goes on top of the crusher run and it helps lock in the brick. So we wanna make sure we don't skip that step next time around. Okay. So the other missing ingredient is the edging. The edging actually locks the brick together, but more importantly, it keeps loom, grass, all that out from underneath the brick. So we wanna make sure we put these rails in when we go back. Okay. All right? I'll loosen everything up with the rake. Dan, why don't you come behind me with the shovel? My wife actually slipped and fell on the uh -oh. ice one. one. We're going to compact the soil down and make sure it's even and firm. You can rent a compactor like this from any home center. Now let's get the pack material back in. We'll use all of yours, and I brought some just in case. Now we'll add the stone dust. When you compact the stone dust, I'm going to spray water ahead of you to keep the dust down. So all right, now we're ready to throw the brick in. What you have is a McAvoy paver. So I went to the store and I got a bunch of McAvoy pavers because we've lost a few here. Okay. So one thing I know about the McAvoy pavers, the edge. See how sharp that is? Yeah. Nice, right? Yeah. The other thing is the coloration. There's a range of color in this brick. So the old McAvoy's are much like the new McAvoy's. Okay. Mark, I noticed that you're running the bricks vertically rather than the way that I laid them out horizontally. Why is that? Uh, actually, we have a number of reasons for that, Dan. Number one, gonna be less cuts. Number two, we're gonna end up with a, a better looking walkway. Well, what about the curve? We don't need to do any cuts there? 
So this curve is soft enough where we're just gonna be able to tweak the joint in the brick. If you go horizontally, it kind of gives you a choppy vision on the walk. And that does look a lot smoother. Right. All right, Dan, so this is the plastic edging that we were talking about. All we have to do is line it up against the brick, nail it down, and it'll be in place. That simple? That simple. So now we're going to sweep the stone dust into those joints. That's going to do two things. It's going to solidify the brick walkway and it's also going to keep those weeds away. Mark, this walkway came out great. All right, well, I'm happy as heck too, but I am going to leave you with a little bit of homework. So you can see that the gaps are coming back after we did the rinse. I did notice well, that. don't worry because it did sink through. It did tighten up the walkway, which is what we wanted. Okay. But now the homework is I'm going to leave you with a bucket of stone dust. After the, this brick dries, you're going to spill it again and just sweep it into all the existing cracks that we have right now. After that, the walkway is going to be tight as heck and you'll never have another problem. Great. I can do right. that. Well, thank you for your help. Thanks for having Thanks. me, man. Take care. You too. Nice job, Mark. That's a good-looking walkway. Thank you. And hey, you know what? No flies on Dan. Good first effort, right? Great first effort. I mean, don't forget, Dan's a dad, right? We all know. I remember those days. Oh, boy. Yeah, everything yeah. gets sped up. That's right. So we have heard a million times that a good walkway starts with good prep, right? Right. And that big, deep layer of all that crushed stone is critical. Right. What I'm not sure everyone sort of appreciates, though, is the freeze-thaw cycle. That's the, sort of the real enemy here. Right. Okay, so freeze-thaw. There's always going to be moisture in that ground. We right. know that. And the freeze-thaw is going to start to occur when the temperature goes below 32 degrees. That's when we get the freeze, and we know that water will expand. So expand. That so now pressure under a stone can be built up and will push that stone under that walkway. So our crushed stone actually would act as a shock absorber. Hmm. So that stone goes up, our crushed stone goes like this. Once the frost dissipates, the stone goes back down into place and it will never show on the walkway. So we're not necessarily stopping a little bit of a bulge. What we are doing is allow it to come back down and go basically flat or level again. That's right. And if you do your prep work correctly, that's exactly how it's going to work. Everything will sink back down into place. So the movement's good. We'll that's get a little right. bit up, but we'll get a little bit back, and it'll be fine. That's right. Very cool. All right. Well, like I said, a beautiful walkway and a good explanation. Thanks, Kevin. All right. That's it from us, but we got plenty more next time. So until then, I'm Kevin O'Connor. I'm Mark McCullough. For Ask This Old House. next time on Ask This Old House. I'll explain what you need to know about proper and practical air filtration in your home. And this Adirondack chair would be a great addition to any backyard, and I'll show you how to build it. All right, so now we have all of our pieces cut, pre-drilled, and sanded, so we're ready for assembly. And I'll show you a few ways to redefine your garden.